Welcome. This is Demystifying Generative Governance. Today, we're going to take a few minutes to talk about um, some myths around the notions of generative thinking. We're going to look at examples of what generative governance is and what it isn't. And um, my goal is for you to leave um, the session today as CEOs and governing bodies with some tips on how to get started. Now, in 2005, uh, BoardSource published the Governance as Leadership text um, from the professors at um, Harvard, Richard Chait and Bill Ryan, along with uh, consultant Barbara Taylor. In 2013, Kathy Trower came out with um, the Protect Practitioner's Guide uh, to Governance as, Le as Leadership to clarify and put into practice the prior work. Since then, it's gained tremendous traction and has been, has been at the same time sort of woefully underused um, and misunderstood or, you know, maybe put aside after some failed initial attempts. Today, we're going to try to undo some of those misses. We'll talk about, again, um, the misconceptions, what it is, and some tips. By way of heads up, this is part one of a three-part series on this topic. The first today, um, then the subsequent one is challenging the notion of efficient meetings. So the trade-offs between effective and efficient, um, helping you identify what your body, governing body needs at any given moment in time, um, sharing some ideas on how to flip the script, script between the two, and some practical tips along the way. Um, so if today is about what is governance, part two is about how do you put it into practice, right? And then so part three, resetting the table for generative thinking. Um, you know, here we get into some very nitty gritty principles about decision making and how to signal change. You know, everything from re revising agenda packets to how to set up the room, technology, and we've learned about technology in the last 18 months, that's for sure. And tips for um, reflecting on how to deepen um, your governing uh, body's practice. So if you're in this session, you've probably seen uh, this triangle somewhere along the way. Um, you've certainly heard some of the concepts. Um, but by way of quick reminder, what we'll be talking about um, through the course of, of this session today uh, has to do with fiduciary governance. And so that's that tangible, tangible, tangible stewardship of assets. Um, on the one hand, the strategic mode that some of you know is as strategic planning um, or foresight work. And then the generative uh, mode where we try to get to more critical leadership and decision making, bringing wisdom to the table and those sorts of things. Now, this is the last time you'll probably see me talk about type or mode. That's the language that governance as leadership uses. I tend to shy away from it because I think it, it um, misleads folks into thinking that they choose one or another or they toggle back and forth. And we'll talk about that a little more in a minute. So the first thing we're gonna to do today is start to talk about um, some of the myths. So let's get going from there. Okie doke, tackling some myths. What are we, what are we gonna to do today? Um, I've got three that I wanna walk through with you. Um, and you know, the first one has to do with getting over the hump of whether this is something new or not, or, or you know, bigger and better, those sorts of things. Um, number two is gonna be about that, that type mode toggle switch and trying to get rid of that a little bit. And three is gonna be about, um, you know, are we doing this sequentially or are, is one future focused and one backward focused? What's, what's sort of some of that differentiation along the way? So number one. Generative governance is a new theory that's better than past practices. It's jargony and hard to learn. Nope, I'm gonna say a great big old note to that. In fact, um, if you've been around in grad school or, or those sorts of things where people talk about these kinds of theories, um, you've seen it in numerous forms over the last, ugh, um, that would be 50 years. Um, it's, it's really not something new. And, you know, if you look closely enough, not much is. Instead, I think of it as a call to action. It's a call to dialogue and reflection 
to inquiry, inquiry that moves thinking upstream from problems to principles, um, to help us question frames and assumptions, to clarify and learn, um, to help us generate collective common meetings. So we're all on the same page and, and doing things for the same reasons based on the, the clues around us. Um, it, it's, it's a challenge. Um, for us to understand and attend to governance more deeply, really, in, in my estimation. And um, it, it sort of tells us that we haven't been doing our job completely up until now. Um, it's about be, doing the job much more completely. So it's not something new, but that doesn't mean we can ignore it. Um, it means that if we tackle the barriers to it and get over the hump, then we can really some, open up um, to something perhaps revolutionary. Um, a little bit on the language. I mentioned this a second ago, but I want to make sure you don't get confused. Um, so when uh, governance as leadership or generative governance talks about type, I want you to think in terms of approach or mindset. You're not a fiduciary board or, you know, whatever type. It's a, your approach or your mindset as you're doing it. When it talks about mode, I want you to think about, you know, you're bringing a certain kind of thinking or a certain kind of question to the mix. Um, and generative, it's just an obnoxious word, right? Um, nobody really likes it and, and I, don't, I don't like it or using fiduciary strategic in, in this kind of way. We can say consequential, we can say complete, we can say just plain good governance. Um, no matter what, my focus is on good governance that allows you to make durable principal decisions um, through shared and collaborative leadership. That's it. So, you know, even the authors of um, the two books have sort of changed their mind in how they talk about these things over the last however many years at this point. And now they, they truly say that um, what they're encouraging above all is that governing bodies, boards, whatever you want to call it, think and act as fiduciary strategists and sense makers at the same time, which means they're providing oversight, foresight, and insight. And when it's effectively enacted, you end up with consequential governance, impactful governance, right? Myth number two, the governing bodies are defined by their type. Um, so, you know, you get to choose which one you are. And by the way, if that's the case, then generative is better than all the rest. No. Um, and honestly, this is where I get a little ornery. Um, those of you who know me know that I'm a recovered attorney um, and um, I'm, First and foremost, pool boards and governing bodies are fiduciaries every minute, every day, period, end of story. I don't want to hear anything else, else about it. That's it. You're fiduciaries all the time. It's your legal obligation. We're not talking about fiduciary duties today, but <laughs> this is where my heart is. Um, being a good fiduciary means engaging in the kind of high level thinking and analysis that generative governance demands of us. Good fiduciaries ask generative questions. I'm also ornery about the whole strategic thing. So similarly, um, we're obliged, you're obliged to set goals and direction, to make plans and assign strategies. And good planning, good strategy asks um, those generative questions as well. Generative thinking is where goal setting and direction setting originate. That helps you define your starting point, your vision horizon, and everything in between. And I've heard some, um, some presentations of late that have sort of compared um, strategic planning uh, or critique of strategic planning where it said that, you know, it's only forward looking um, or it only looks at one scenario or it only um, looks at current uh, forces versus emerging forces or those sorts of things. Um, and, and I understand why, why, why folks would have that critique because honestly, that's often how it's practiced. Um, but again, strategic planning in its, in its glory um, includes every end of that spectrum. Um, and if generative governance discussion is what we need to do, talk about to get there, if foresight is what we need to talk about to get there, I'm fine with all of it. But recognize that fiduciary is a mandate, strategic is a mandate, and generative is, is how we do it more deeply and more completely over, over time. So part three, uh, or myth three, governing bodies use the types sequentially 
Um, and generative real is really just about the, the, the future part. Um, so, you know, in other words, we're trying to be, um, we're, we're moving to becoming a, a generative board or, or those sorts of things. Um, you know, in, in practice, we end up doing some of, uh, some of the thinking sequentially, but really it's about going deeper. Um, so what I've got in front of you on, on the screen right now is um, a mental model or a map um, that uh, Dr. Chait uses and, and um, Kathy Trower built on um, in her work. And there's a, there's a nice sort of um, description that, that is used um, that I'm really gonna, I'm gonna quote from, so you'll, you'll have to forgive me. Um, but what you see here is, is a logical river in front of you, right? And uh, for many governing boards, they enter in over on the right um, at the beachfront. And you know, they're making yes or no technical decisions in response to recommendations or immediate problems or immediate mandates, right? Every once in a while, um, they say, let's go upriver up to the bluff to a cabin where we can see down and look down over that beachfront and have a, have a better view of what's going on um, to plan. Um, think retreat. <laughs> and uh, we'll pursue strategies and those sorts of things. We can see from that vantage point where there are going to be choices down below us where we can choose one tributary or another um, to go down. But really what we need to go to, to do is to go further upstream to the headwaters. Um, that's where the generative work uh, takes place. It's the source of the water before the landscape comes into play, the pollutants, interventions, any of that sort of stuff. Um, and it's where we can, we're even higher up than the bluff. We can see further out, further back, import, importantly, both forward and backward and out from us. Um, so, you know, if we're asking one question down at the beachfront, we're, we're asking a broader one from the cabin and a broader one still from the headwaters. Uh, so while many boards um, get there logically in sequence, um, ideally we start up at the headwaters and um, get more narrow going forward. And you know the, the typical curve, um, the, the, the yellow curve is unfortunately the way most of us spend our time. We barely touch on generative sorts of things and the vast majority of our time is spent um, on fiduciary questions. And the reality of it is that, um, or the first, first law of generative governance, honestly, is that the opportunity to influence generative work declines over time. Um, and so the corollary would be that the uh, board involvement is lowest where the generative opportunity is greatest uh, most of the time. And again, this is what we're trying to um, move away from. So another way of thinking of it, um, maybe not so much as the river, but uh, is to think about, yes, if, if we are sort of defining three different domains or modes or types or whatever language you wanna talk about, um, we're not doing them side by side, or we're not even really doing them butted up against each other. Our goal is to have them integrated, interwoven, overlapping all the time um, by paying attention to where the opportunities are to have one kind of conversation versus another. So with all of that in mind, let's get on to the next steps. All right, Sarah. So we've spent a lot of time talking about what generative governance isn't. What the holy heck is it? Um, again, quoting from the sources, uh, here are a couple of the, um, of the um, definitions that uh, they use. I particularly like um, the pieces that talk about finding, framing, and focusing on what matters. Um, to, think, uh, to talk about generating shared understanding and the whole think first, think hard about what's at issue, right? So think about think about your board for a second. Um, let's say you, you just voted to set uh, your discount rate or your confidence level or settlement authority, or you know, think about those kinds of decisions that you all know so well. It's likely that um, the board, uh, the governing body voted yes or no based on a specific recommendation from staff or advisors um, but that each of you, when you made, when you took that vote, 
you might have had a slightly different set of parameters in your head as to why you did it. Um, so, uh, you know, you had a different perspective on the immediate impact on either premium or contribution, whichever language you use, its impact on surplus level, or um, were you looking to industry standards? Were you trying to adhere to larger principles or values? I'd ask you to think about when, when you made, took these votes, do you know um, what guided your, your board? And how do you know that? Um, will, your, will your governing body remember um, that reasoning the next time it comes up um, or, or and, and say, no, we did this for this reason, right? Um, or will they be have to recreate the wheel and, and sort of go back to, to zero again down the line? Um, did they think about the unintended consequences, not just the intended consequences, right? That's the shared meaning part in all of this. When all of you know what the answer to those questions are and you have the same answer or you at least have agreed to disagree along the way, right? Um, so here, here Sarah is back again with the knots. Um, so just to be clear, we're not talking about, you know, big, hairy, uh, audacious goals or blue sky thinking or wholesale change or any of that sort of stuff. Um, we're talking about those, those deeper questions to understand the impact and the why um, of what we're doing. We're, we're trading um, the bugaboo of micro governance for macro governance um, to get a higher level of, of engagement, higher level of flow, um, and um, that, you know, if that, if that collective mind can be engaged, that we can all make better decisions. Why should pools care? Um, good question. So, you know, it, it's for some of the, the same reasons that, that other sorts of organizations care. Um, we know that we all struggle on the one hand um, with dysfunctions um, in, in our governing bodies. Um, so the classic dysfunctions of groups or, or we complain that they're disengaged or they don't know what their job is. Uh, Engaging in generative discussion is one way to combat um, those, those standard um, concerns. Pools are also complex. Um, one of the reasons I love working with pools is you sit at this very interesting intersection of government, corporate, and nonprofit models and with elements of all of them, um, which makes you endlessly fascinating, but also endlessly complex. Um, and you have to deal with, with very um, complicated environments, which means that each of those technical decisions have far greater impact because they pull on so many different threads, right? The third reason why you should care is, and, and why um, generative governance is, is so critical for you um, is you work in uncertain environments, heck, um, you, you're managing risk, which is the definition of uncertainty, right? Um, you're in the public domain, um, in the public sphere, which means you're guaranteed that to have contested um, goals that, you know, people are going to have different, um, want to have different, different things come to play. And you're balancing these, these, these the constituency groups between the members, the whole, and, and, and government concerns and, and purpose, which means that the meaning, understanding the meaning of what you do really does matter. Um, you know, when, when I hear um, you guys talk about things like I don't wanna be insurance, um, the meaning of that matters. You, you, you guys are built on something different that, is, that requires this kind of, of conversation. So the model and action, you are skirting around the edges of it in a number of ways already. You always are. Mission, vision, and values conversations, first and foremost. Those are opportunities to discern. Those are opportunities for, um, for generative governance. When you talk about litigation and claim strategies, your settlement philosophy, your settlement authority levels, those are prime opportunities for generative conversation. When you're setting surplus, again, I meant that was the example I used earlier, prime opportunities. 
leadership succession. Go back to the to the last webinar in, in, in this series and talk about leadership succession and pipelines and culture. Are we talking about the board? Are we talking about staff? Are we talking about turnover, retirement, emergencies? Having that complete conversation requires generative questioning. And of course, the last 18 months, pandemics, if, if we didn't know our core or have an opportunity to talk about our core, we had huge opportunities to go sideways. Um, and of course, the virtual assembly last month, the month before, I've lost all track of time. Uh, every topic that came up in virtual assembly came up because it was a topic with a generative feel to it. It, it was because it had, um, it was a topic where um, you could come at it from different directions and end up at different solutions as, as a result. Think about it, law enforcement. Are we talking about social change? Are we talking about runaway juries? Are we talking about bad behavior or bad training? Which frame we use makes an enormous difference. Being on the same page as to that frame makes an enormous difference. So Sarah, you're talking in metaphors. Let's, let's uh, make it simpler for us and, and think about um, the most mundane of, of examples. So your audit report. The fiduciary act is accepting the report. It's getting it, it's doing the it's oversight, it's getting it. Taking fiduciary to an inquiry level means you're asking about the assumptions behind it. Taking it to a planning level and a strategic thinking level means you're asking how you got the results that you got in the, in the audit. Are they the results you wanted to? Do you need new strategies to get to those results? But ultimately the framing questions, the generative questions is, are why do we want those results in the first place? What do results mean? Why do they matter? Those sorts of questions. That's what we're going for. We're going, continuing to move up and up and upstream um, to go deeper and recognize that many of you will start with the fiduciary act and work backwards. That's just the way your brain works and you gotta walk before you can run. Um, but over time, we want to get to the headwaters first and, and work our way down. So now we know, have a better sense of what it is. The next step is some tools and some ideas to get started. All right, getting started. Part two and three of this series are going to talk much more about the details, right? Um, tackling barriers to change and other sorts of, of ideas to get you started. Um, but I know that, that you will be unhappy if you leave today's session without at least a few thoughts um, that you can be ruminating on before we get to those, to those sessions. So here we are at part three um, of today's session. And, and so let's, let's dive in a little bit about it. Um, so how can we, how can you flex your muscles, uh, your generative muscles without overdoing? On, on the left of your, your screen, you'll see an initial set of, of questions um, that, you know, you might want to have at your side along the way um, where you can, you know, just use them as a guide in any old meeting. meeting. Um, you, you go through a topic and you take a second and you say, okay, let's, let's think about some of these questions. That's, that's a very tangible first step you can take. I want to be very clear um, that you don't want to overdo though. Um, and and um, the, the authors of, of this work are very clear about this too. But as I look at presentations from various places around the country on, on this topic, um, I see them slipping into the misuses, right? And I know for a fact, I've you know, seen it in action where they slip into to the misuses and it's understandable. Um, much of, of what generative governance is about is about slowing down and um, getting into the complexity of things. And our instinct is always to make it as simple and formulaic and checklist as we can possibly do. So um, our instincts run counter to what we're doing here and lead us down, down the merry path toward mistakes. So like any good diet, everything in moderation. Don't overuse any one mode. Don't be formulaic. It's not 30% of the time we're going to be generative and, you know, 10%. No, please, please, please don't do that. 
Um, don't find generative work where it doesn't exist. Every, every action, every discussion does not generative conversation make. Sometimes it's the wrong time. Sometimes it's the wrong place. Sometimes you've already had the generative discussion, you've done the work. Um, and sometimes it really just is a matter of, it's a technical question without any sort of stuff, you know, do it and be done with it. It can be tempting for folks who want change in organizations to treat it as a hobby horse, to make it part of an agenda or a reform, don't do that. Um, and, and the biggest risk in all of this, I let you read the rest, I don't need to read it all to you, but the biggest risk in all of this um, is, is, is not only becoming form, too formulaic, but to un underestimate how strong the pull is of the status quo, how appealing it is to do those checkmark approaches, to get as quickly to decisions as solving problems as humanly possible. Um, that is, that's sort of the biggest risk in all of this um, that I challenge you to be on the lookout for. Some other tools and, and um, practices for you to think about in, in the practice makes perfect kind of, kind of notion. Uh, first, a couple tools. Notice cues and clues. For those of you who have gone through the, the foresight training, you're going to think of this in terms of signals, right? Cues and clues, signals, the same kind of, kind of idea. Um, and we know that most boards are isolated from those signals um, and it's some of that isolation that we're trying to overcome. Choose and use frames, and, and I should add in, in, in here deliberately, right? Make sure you're doing it on purpose. And uh, the, third, the third tool to use is to think retrospectively. Um, we are taught in, in every context you can think of not to dwell in the past, not to get not stuck in history, not to get all that sort of stuff. Um, and we want our leaders to be, you know, one step ahead and looking ahead. The truth is that we learn from the past. We make sense from the past. And we have to look backward to do that learning in order to move forward. If we move forward without learning from the past, what is it? History repeats itself, right? Um, so we have to like, think retrospectively. We have to make space to do it, time to do it. And we have to prioritize it. So notice the signals, be deliberate in your choice of frame and think retrospectively, learn from your past, take time to come up with a shared meaning of what that past is. So as you're doing this, um, Chay, uh, Professor Chait says, wear your trifocals, <laughs> fiduciary strategic generative, keep your trifocals on. Just like trifocals, you sort of constantly moving back and forth, depending on what you're doing. You're not putting on and taking off different pairs of glasses, right? The misuse is taking on and putting off pairs of glasses. The proper use is trifocals. Pause at the boundaries. Governing bodies sit at the boundary between inside the organization and outside, between members and, board, and organization, um, between government and, and policy. Pay. Those are the boundaries. And that's where the genius of, of good governance comes from is because it can, it, can talk, it can toggle between them, it can translate them, it can have them inform each other. I think about, um, uh, you know, many of you are not only on the board, the, the governing body of, of your pool, but you're on the governing body of your, your home entity or some other entity. You, so that's another boundary, right? Bringing the information from one to the other and back attending to those boundaries. Um, look for generative landmarks. So landmarks, these are, these are the things that say, that say hello, this is, this is a generative issue coming your way, right? And those in, landmarks have to do with anywhere there's ambiguity, um, where there's particular saliency, where it, it, saliency being the opportunity for, for ex, extraordinary impact. Someplace where the stakes are high, or there's particular strife. Again, think about those virtual assembly items. Um, there are a number of those that are socially contested right now, right? Um, and that social contest, that strife means it is an opportunity for generative governance. And, and of course, um, if you're looking at a decision that, um, you know, once you make it, there, there's, there's no going back, baby. 
um, once you once you put out that that um, assessment to your members, um, that cat's gone, right? So that's an opportunity coming back. Um, and and so and and then in the bottom corner here, I've got sort of a, a map of integrating the, the thinking that gives you an additional set of dimensions that you can think about. Um, if you don't have the questions in front of you from the prior slide, maybe you can have this little chart in front of you um, that then says, okay, have we have we looked upstream and backward? Have we looked downstream and forward? Have we, you know, ask those sorts of alternate questions so that you get a complete fit picture. Again, when I think about governance, generative governance, I'm thinking about a more complete deeper version of good governance that we should be practicing together on a regular basis, right? So we keep moving upstream, we get the view of the bluff, we get the view from the headwaters, um, we, we go as, as deep as we can and we increase um, the opportunity for generative work, um, which means that we also have to reduce the opportunity for fiduciary work. We need to sort of rebalance some of these sorts of things. I've also got a got a um, a tool in here that that um, again makes some additional comparisons um, as you make this mind start making the mind shift, start making the paradigm shift, whether it's from fiduciary thinking to more strategic thinking, or whether you're 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 going the full leap to more of a generative mindset. Um, there are some some landmarks here for you to to think about. Um, and honestly, the, the table on the right um, has a lot of the issues that we're going to talk about in the next series, in the next part of the series. So preserving congeniality, pursuing consensus, meeting efficiency, efficiently, um, all sound really, really great. Um, but they are all, in fact, uh, a little bit of barrier to doing our best work. Um, so how can we how can we accept that they're barriers and, and begin to move move forward from them? Because in the end, back to that definition that I had a little while ago that I, that I liked from the authors where they talk about finding, framing, and focusing on the most important issues. Um, when you think of generative governance, I want you to think about finding and framing um, by looking back to reflect, by looking outward right now to scan and experiment, and looking ahead to anticipate and strategize. And to get there, we need to be we need to be able to focus. And here we'll spend a lot of time in part three talking about focus. You need to be able to focus as a governing body to have the time to think and discuss, space to explore and play with ideas, permission to ask the questions and make the changes, um, free as much as we can. That's why I've got the line through it from distractions because we know we can't be free from distractions. But how can we keep reducing them? Um, and reducing them and um, to, it's all about focus, all about focus. So you know what? That's what I have to say in part one of demystifying generative governance. And um, I look forward to seeing you in part two and three.